welcome everyone to the latest call. Um, thank you for giving up a bit of your afternoon. Um, in the, the call today, we are going to be uh, just having a bit of a discussion around the, the current status and next steps for the booking API specification. Um, Chris has done uh, some really good work on moving that spec forward uh, to get us closer to a state where we can feel confident about putting a 1.0 label on it. Um, I, we haven't had a huge amount of feedback since the, over the last few weeks, um, which uh, I'm not sure whether to take positively, uh, that there are no major issues uh, or that uh, we need to do more to kind of do a bit of outreach. So um, uh, if all of you can uh, you know, reach out to people that you know who have expressed an interest in this, that would be useful. Because um, I think the more, um, uh, the more feedback we get, the more confident we can be about kind of drawing a line under this, uh, the next, couple, next version or so of this spec uh, and moving on to some other things. So uh, let me just share my, my slides. So um, yeah, so the agenda is just going to have a uh, summarized status of the, the API. There's a couple of um, issues that I wanted to kind of have a discussion around. So you've got people got feedback on, um, and then just highlight some other areas where um, we're looking for feedback and comment from the community as well. Uh, and if there's anything else anyone wants to talk about at the end, then I'll uh, try and keep some time free. Um, so where we're at with booking, um, they're, they're, we're currently at a 0 0.7 draft, which I think is um, more or less complete. There's, as I say, there's a couple of issues I want to talk about today, um, but in terms of um, coverage of the requirements that we captured um, a few months ago back in the original workshop and in the discussions that we've had so far, I think reasonably confident that um, this covers the essential parts of um, third-party booking. We know there's a whole range of other requirements that people have um, around booking, customer management, payments, waiting lists, etc. cetera, um, but that is all stuff that we can build on this foundation. Um, and one of the things I wanted to kind of touch on today was just kind of going through where the extension points are to allow us and also people in the community to build on this work. So um, spec goes into quite a lot of detail now around um, the, uh, what the booking uh, flow uh, looks like. Um, so just to kind of uh, just jump to the diagram, but just to kind of summarize uh, how we've, we've gone ahead, it, the, uh, we are in this specification, we are not dealing with uh, issues like authentication and security because we expect every platform to have their own preferred way of doing this. We are just standardizing the workflow through how a, um, a third party booking is made on a booking system. Um, we're also not dealing with payments um, because again, we think that there are a variety of different uh, payment options that people will want to support both to uh, give us some flexibility to consumers, but also depending on the requirements of specific um, platforms and uh, client-side applications. So we're not getting into that as well. So the basic flow, um, which we've talked about on previous calls, is um, that a client will be able to um, query to get the current status of an event, so they can get the current, currently available offers, um, get the current um, uh, availability of the event, so is there actually a space to book, um, so that they can provide a customer with um, a list of options to allow them to book a place, so purchase uh, a spot to participate in the activity. Um, the client will then be, will be able to take out a lease, so to temporarily reserve a space for uh, the customer to um, attend an event or to use facility whilst they carry out any other kind of client side activities that need to happen. So um, taking payments, um, displaying terms and conditions, etc. Um, the uh, responsibility will be on the client for, for taking, the, the, taking the payment and then updating the booking system to confirm um, when that has been taken successfully. Um, uh, any subsequent 
kind of flow um, about how a user is notified or uh, kept informed about updates to an event is kind of out of scope for the API. So there are there's certain things that um, we know that will need to happen to you know, engage with support customers and participants, but those aren't really a part of the core uh, booking workflow. Um, we have documented in the latest iterations support for um, cancellations, uh, and that's one of the things I wanted to just briefly touch on um, uh, in the discussion. So that workflow, we've, like I say, we've talked about that quite a bit. Nobody's really had any major issues with that. Um, uh, the, the, it's not really deviated from the early prototypes that uh, a number of people have been doing against um, Again, you know the, the early draft of the specification. The only things that we've refined is some of the details around um, which HTTP methods we're using to interact with through the API. Some of the uh, details of the um, the data formats that's been exchanged for error conditions or details of um, how a um, uh, an offer or an, or an order is described has, has evolved slightly, but there hasn't really been any major changes to that workflow. So that, that's one of the reasons why I'm reasonably confident that that's kind of stable because it, it seems to be something that people feel comfortable with. Um, so uh, when I reviewed the... Um, Lee, sorry, um, yeah. I just got a question, but tell me if it's better to pop in at the end. No, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, and apologies if this has been covered in like earlier calls, obviously I'm only coming onto the project now in that sense. Um, something um, when I went to meet with the startups who are part of the accelerator that someone mentioned was that some of the, and I don't know whether this is a booking point or a kind of data model point or, some, or something else that just needs to be addressed at some point, was that some of the opportunities that were available to book were for like 2019. And obviously I know that, for example, sometimes a leisure center might only uh, release onto their system like the next week's worth of booking things. Um, I don't know if that's been covered elsewhere in the spec, spec, spec or, or that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that so that I think um, yeah. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, the, yeah, there are, will be events and sessions that will be projected quite a long time in the future, but you may not be able to book those yet. Or, exactly. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of ways in which um, that is supported in the data model currently. Um, so the, the, the kind of the crudest way is that if um, if the platform doesn't provide any offers, so any information on pricing or availability, then the events won't be bookable. Um, but they, we also allow them to advertise an offer, but indicate when that offer is available from. So start and end. So that this is to uh, deal with. Um, uh, requirements such as um, you know there's an event on Friday but you can't start booking until like Thursday afternoon for example so um, there we would be able to set you be able to still indicate somebody what the price would be but um, a client would be able to see that actually they, they can't take a user through that workflow until that point so a user would have to come back at that at that stage um, but, you know, there's an opportunity there for a application to you know send a reminder to the user that the, um, the offer they're interested in is available. So, so I think we have, have some support for that. Cool, thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the thing, couple of things I wanted to kind of... Uh, oh, just, sorry, Lee, I was just unmute that. Uh, just on, on that one, just a quick one while we're talking about that. Um, there's also valid from and valid through properties, which are um, similar to the availability starts and ends. Um, I don't know if we want to just check we're using the right property because I think I thought that from and to or what uh, do what you just described there. But, um, they're both schema.org and they're both on the offer. So it's worth checking. Okay. Chris, can I ask you to make a note just to just double check that? Might be on mute, Chris. Yep, off mute now. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes, Lee. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, that's good catch. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the things that we haven't really talked about are the, the, the terms and conditions bit and the cancellations and refunds. Um, so I just briefly wanted to kind of quickly talk through that just to um, 
just make sure everyone is uh, comfortable with what we need to cover and the kind of how strong the language needs to be in the specification around support for this, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, extension points. Um, and then the only real open issue discussion we have is around how we, about free events and currency displays, which Chris, Nick and I have been discussing. If we get time, we can talk about that. Otherwise we can do, carry on on, on GitHub. Um, so for terms and conditions, um, there's, I think broadly there's two things that we need, we need to be able to do. Um, Somebody who's uh, placing a booking needs to be able to see, read any terms and conditions that apply to the booking that they're placing with the platform. You know, so there will be some kind of um, uh, terms of service, terms of use that will uh, govern uh, their booking. Um, from a GDPR point of view, um, a user also needs to be aware or be signposted to any privacy notices or policies that might apply or that will apply to handling of their personal data. So we've minimized the amount of information that is being passed around about a user, but there's still a name and an email address that goes is going via the broker to the booking system. So I think we need to be able to surface that information somewhere in the workflow. Um, I don't think we have to make strong requirements about how that is displayed or where it's displayed, but I think there is some requirements that we need to put in place to make sure that clients are making them visible at some point in the, in the interaction. Um, so in the specification at the moment, um, it's, uh, we're proposing to use a schema.org property called Terms of Service, um, which is a, a pending property. So it's something that is still under discussion, um, which allows, uh, uh, allow somebody to point to the terms of service that apply to well broadly any application so it seems like it's potentially applicable to capturing that but linking to the the terms of service information that apply to an offer so in the specification at the moment we say that an offer could have a terms of service property that would be that uh, the link to the information that a user may need to see so what we're not doing is bundling all of that, you know, trying to describe all of those terms of service. It's just, there is a document somewhere that you can read and agree to. Um, what I realized is that we don't, at the moment, the spec doesn't have anything around privacy notices, which I think is a, is a gap. So I think we probably need to, get to add a similar property to do the same thing for um, privacy notices so that those can be advertised as well. Um, it, in terms of the current data model, those seem to fit more closely in offers, although my suspicion is that these terms of service and privacy notices will be consistent across a booking system and they will apply to every offer um, or you know, every event, every use of the facility um, that is coming from that booking system. So there is a little bit of redundancy in, in including these in every single offer, but we don't have another kind of useful hook to provide that information without providing, say, um, another URL endpoint to look up this kind of generic service level information from the API. Um, cool. so would you say that this would be uh, an event level service, terms of service and privacy notice rather than a, an offer level? Do you expect them to change between offers where there could be like 10 or 12 offers for a particular event? Um, I, I don't expect them to change between offers necessarily, but it, it, it feels but it feels like from a semantic kind of modeling point of view, it feels like it's more aligned with an offer than an event or a facility use. Because it because everything around um, eligibility, other kind of context that applies to the offer is also part of that, that bit of the model. Um, if it didn't fit at the offer level, I would say that it's probably at the service level, which we don't actually describe anywhere at the moment. Um, so you say you could create a service object or something? Yeah, we are, I mean, another, so an alternative approach would we end up having a, an, a, an endpoint somewhere that, um, uh, at the, which it describes a service, which is the, the booking system you're interacting with, and we use that as a hook to provide this um, system level information. So you would do a get request on, the, on a service URL, and it would say, this is the terms of service, this is a privacy notice, maybe who, who it is that's running this, um, the system. There might be other metadata that we want to put in there. For example, like default lease duration. 
Ollie, I've been thinking a bit about this and thinking about whether that's what you put at the root of um, the API, because then you can also tell people where to discover the feed and um, can describe how you can get an API key and things like that. Yes, yeah, I, I, I was had similar thoughts before about how we discover some of this kind of high, high level information. Um, but I, I'm kind of in two minds at the moment about the best way forward, whether to just go with this because it's relatively straightforward um, or to, um, to introduce new API endpoint. Does anybody have any, any, any comments? We probably need playways and book, book when uh, in this conversation, actually. I imagine they'll have, specifically the reason that they're interesting is because they both have a single feed which contains multiple customers. Um, and they also provide um, the ability to specify terms and conditions um, for your per, on a per customer basis within their configuration. So um, that's they're good examples where you would have, yeah, you, you, your feed would, the terms of service would change. Um, it does seem, feel like there must be another, there must be a third way here. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, book when specifically you can create like 15, 20 offers for per event and they've got schedules in place, which means that you don't then duplicate those across. Well, you have inheritance anyway, but you don't duplicate those across all of the um, sub events. Um, so we've kind of already minimized that to an extent. Um, I just wonder whether there's a way that we can have that service you describe as a, a an object which actually exists and is related to the event. So the event links to a service, the service has this information, um, and then the offers obviously are related to the event which also has the service or something. That means we don't have to duplicate the same thing 15 times. Yeah, they, um, well, my other thought, um, just trying to find an example of the spec. My other thought was, was to actually do something um, w with the potential action, but that is still part of the, the offer. It just, it just some, from a semantic point of view, it doesn't seem to make sense to say that an event has a term of ser terms of service, because that that probably applies to, more like applies to, you know, your rights around refunds, etc., rather than um, participating in the event. Sorry, this is this bit's changed. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't notice that. I thought potential action was on the event. It's now moved to the offer. So that means that potential action is also going to be duplicated fifteen times. Uh, potentially the same the same issue it applies to both I mean if we need to create a service that includes potential action and the relevant terms of service that can be included once per event rather than multiple times yeah yeah that's true okay I think I mean, one of the reasons why we moved potential action on to an offer is that there was a possibility you might be able to get an offer via a URL. So there might be a URI for that particular offer. And you might actually need all of the information about how you would book it from, from that particular endpoint rather than from within an event. Yeah, um, I guess there was, there was a thought before about that only being, the offer only being useful in the context of an event due to the kind of metadata that's in the event itself, like title and description. Mm. And an offer on its own tends to be junior uh, something, uh, you know, junior member, 30, um, 30 pounds. So uh, you can't, it doesn't necessarily give you enough information to fully describe it to then proceed with a booking. Um, I see. Yeah, I can see where that's kind of, kind of come from. I guess there's a. I suppose it's probably the same. There maybe is an overall principle here with sub events and with offers, where where we've got things in the tree that have lots of stuff in them. Uh, if we should be able to inherit that stuff from the parent, really, because otherwise we're going to just, for the sake of semantics, be creating these massive objects. Okay. Um. For the for the purposes of time i'm going to suggest that we, we we kind of revisit this and so have a separate just dis have a discussion maybe open an issue to discuss where these properties sit um, and where potential action is um, 
but I think re regardless of where potential action sits in the, in the model, that could be a place to put it. You know, if you're completing this action, then it will be within this terms of service. This is how your your data will be be used. Um, even if it's not properties of the action, it could be could be de uh, describing the service here as well. Uh, could although potential action has other purpose, other uses across um, searches and all sorts of things. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it would just be properties, extra properties for a particular type of action. Not right. Okay, so uh, it looks like we've maybe got a bit of work to do on the, the model. What I wanted to just talk about as well was the requirements. So I think the, the language and the specification needs to be a bit, uh, a bit clearer about what brokers should be doing with this information when it's available. So just some conformance uh, wording. So I think our expectations would be that if there's a terms of service, if there is a privacy notice, then um, that that link should that must be displayed to a user and they must accept the terms of service before um, completing the action so there should be some we're not saying how they're displayed or you know whether it's a checkbox or what what interaction there is but they should, the broker should be doing something with that information when it's available um, so there's some musts there also that um, the, uh, the, the application should be allowing a user to click through and look at the, the document that's at the end of that URL as part of the workflow, you know whether it's pop, whether it's going to try and uh, grab the HTML or pop up a frame or something, you know, it's up to the client. We don't need to get into that. Um, but I think there should be some wording here to make sure that people are confident about uh, that information is going to be uh, used correctly. Are there other things that we think that um, users need to be able to do or Brokers should do with terms and conditions. Um, from our perspective, uh, just showing a link and um, allowing a user to click through to that link if they want is enough. Uh, yeah. We don't need any positive action, and uh, this would work perfectly for us. Okay. Okay. Uh, for oh, sorry. No, you go, go, go. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is kind of like maybe just beyond the realms of what we need to think about realistically right now. Um, if that data was being held outside of the EU, is there something you need to kind of agree to? Well, I mean, obviously, I keep getting those like pop ups. I, I'm never quite sure if it's just because people don't know GDPR very well or something else. But <laughs> I, I think it, the privacy notice should should cover that kind of. Uh, that kind of detail um, and then it's up to the user whether they decide to proceed okay. um, you know that's that you know the ICO guidance for what you should be including your privacy notice should be things like is your data going to go outside the EU so I think we don't I'm not sure that we need to put that level of detail in but um, it might be worth adding a link in the specification to say you know we don't have We'll just add a note somewhere to say, you know, we're not going to tell you what to put in your privacy notice. Here's what his ICO's guidance, you know, just to encourage best practices. Yeah, I think that would be useful for people. I mean, I'm sure people have got it in their minds anyway, but yeah. no harm in reinforcing it. Yeah, I mean, all of these this, these kind of requirements on here, I would expect it to be kind of a no-brainer, but it's just kind of what we have to... Never assume, Lee, never assume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pulling um, Fusion and um, Everyone Active's requirements into this uh, for Gladstone, they actually, Gladstone have as part of their GDPR, um, probably, the, I don't know if, if people are overcomplicating it, who knows, uh, to Izzy's point, but um, they uh, have a thing that you can do where you make, when you create the member in the system, which is effectively saying this person has ticked the box to consent to marketing, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they provide a, a bit of a text for the marketing tick box. And then when you tick the box, you can say, this has been ticked. Um, and the reason that's something that everyone active and uh, fusion particularly care about is that they're really interested in, um, talking to these people in a context other than just for the use of the service, um, as part of their kind of core business. Part of the reason they're interested in open data is to upsell member membership to people. If someone comes into the center, they want to, if, even if they book from, through my local pitch or somewhere else, they want to be able to say, 
that they can email those people and targeted marketing and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that requirement probably looks like a string that is able to be put somewhere and then some positive action that we can record. Okay. Um, but they, okay. So is a, I mean, that sounds reasonable uh, as a challenge to that. You could, I could say, well, it's legitimate for them to be uh, emailing the user at the, at the end of the booking workflow. They could be prompting user to sign up for marketing, et cetera, at that point. Yeah, as you can imagine, this is something that they've spent a lot of time and money on figuring out because that's the, the, the question of whether their emails are service emails or marketing emails has big implications in all of their kind of upselling um, and their, their view. Um, this is, I'm talking Ben Beavers, everyone active specifically now. Uh, Ben's view is that uh, he wants to make sure that they maximize the opportunity to engage with these people and doesn't think that. Uh, having just a yeah a, a service email with a with a subscribe button, no one clicks that. So it's that's that's not for him. So, that's not. Him. So that's an extra property then a, a kind of marketing opt-in message, uh, which must be provided, perhaps. Yeah, I, but is that a must or um, an option? I yeah. I, well, I was going to I was going to ask that whether we should we should be saying it's must or whether we should. Say, a slightly softer bit of language would be to say the broker should follow whatever rules or expectations of the booking system. I mean, potentially that, yeah, I guess Jamie's, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a, it's a should technically, but if Ben makes it a must for whatever contract gets signed, then obviously the broker will have to make it a must, but not because it's technically a must because it's part of the agreement. Yeah, I mean, if, if, sorry, go ahead. Uh, our experience of this is um, that, yes, operators are now starting to ask that, uh, and they have the right to ask that because they're also the data controller, um, but they can't make it a required opt-in to proceed with the booking. So, um, you know, they can ask the question, and if the user doesn't opt-in, then that is fed through the API and tells the system that they haven't given their consent. And then things like those emails you mentioned are actually not um, allowed by, um, uh, or there's a court case around a, um, a car manufacturer, I think, who did that and it was proven by the courts at the time that um, they weren't actually allowed to ask uh, how their service was if they didn't have the positive opt-in, if it includes any marketing communication in it. So why don't you come back next time or book next week um, is counted as a marketing uh, communication. Um, so wow. it's, it's a kind of a tricky one because obviously an operator will want to send that uh, email. Out. And uh, it's whether people want to get kind of... Um, wrapped up in a legal uh, conversation with the operators, with both sides arguing different points and it's a bit of a gray area. So um, I don't think there's any concrete uh, answer at the moment. The advice we were given is that they're not able to. We had a conversation with an operator who says they are able to. Um, and given the sign up rates tend to be pretty small for the second person, uh, the second marketing communication email, um, it's quite often just not worth arguing that much about. Um, uh, oddly, with the operator, we did have the uh, conversation about it with. We've got a higher rate of return than any other. So um, uh, it's kind of often a overstated uh, point at, at this stage. And I think when there's a little bit more guidance from uh, the EU, etc., on whether people are allowed to go back without marketing communication. I think that will be made more clear over the coming months. Okay. Okay, that's great. Uh, okay, so we shouldn't be putting musts in then because we don't want to be making... I think we'll just have need to craft some language around brokers should be following... Uh, you know, whatever their contractual agreement is with the booking system should be following whatever um, privacy marketing best practices are um, with regard to that, that information. Um, 
Chris, the other thing to think about then is if we're is how we also uh, indicate back in the the booking, the kind of taken out of the lease that somebody has opted in for that marketing information. Okay. All right, so uh, that was what I wanted to cover on terms and conditions. Anyone got anything else they want to add or questions to raise on that? Otherwise, I'm going to skip on to cancellations and refunds. Okay, I'm going to move on then. Um, um, guys, I'm actually just going to duck out at this point. Okay. But, uh, just to say that uh, we, we have given it a really good uh, review, the, um, the, the spec, and... Uh, it looks great from our perspective, um, and I know that Javi, one of our guys who's really knowledgeable about booking APIs, uh, thinks it's uh, extremely well written and um, should work brilliantly. So, um, yeah, it's the kind of thumbs up from us. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, nice and Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. I'll, sec I'll second that as well. We've taken a look at it, James and Sherman House specifically and couldn't find anything wrong with it. They're really happy with the position that it's in. So yeah, good work, guys. Cool. Great, and we're, we're also using that data validator, which um, uh, is working really well as well. So great work on that. Cool. Great. Cheers. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, cancellation and refunds. So again, this seems like it's relatively uh, one of those things where it seems like a relatively no-brainer, but there will be some wrinkles in it somewhere. Um, so it's worth talking through. So, you know, I would, I think broadly, users should be able to cancel uh, and then get a refund for something that they've booked. Um, we've said in the, the specification that because the broker is handling payments, then the broker should also be handling cancellations and refunds and then we'll be updating the booking system of canceled orders. And there's an API endpoint to cover that. Okay, so um, that, that's kind of the, the features there to, to cover it. Um, but I think there's a couple of things that again, we might worth discuss around the, the conformance language too. So um, here's the start of the 10. So a broker must allow you to cancel and receive refund. Now, after I wrote that, I immediately thought that there's likely to be caveats that platforms will say you can cancel up to maybe 48 hours or two hours or something before an event. It's quite common for hotel bookings, for example, that there will be a time limit on it. Um, we haven't really specified a way to do that at the moment. Um, and also be aware that some underlying systems don't support cancellation at all which might limit their ability to implement this. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a good, that's an interesting one. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, so a broker you know, must inform the booking system of cancellations as they occur. So you know, as and when they happen, not batching them up and doing them you know, every week or something. Um, and then the, We've, we've said in the spec that we're, we're not really specifying what kind of email interactions go on after a booking is confirmed. Um, but I think we should say that there's, um, um, there's, I think feel like there should be some language to say we're, we're equally not going to, not going to specify what uh, communications happen around cancellations. But if you've told the user that they've confirmed a space, it's not unreasonable to expect you to also confirm to them that their space has been cancelled and a refund has, has, has happened. Um, you know, just so that they've got that confidence, they've got that trust, so there's consistency. Um, <clears throat> so, so going back over that then, so Nick, your kind of broad point of that some platforms don't allow cancellations, um, that would mean that they can't implement that bit of the API. Um, so that Could means... Lee, could there be a property on the offer saying that they don't implement cancellations? Um, well, you. Well, it's a good question, right? So there's there's two ways to indicate it. If there's no if there's no cancel action like on the uh, on the order, it can't be cancelled. So it's kind of implicitly there through that. It is, but you'd only see that after you've created an order. Yes, that is true. So whether. 
So any rules about whether you can cancel or whether there's a time window for cancellations might need to be made available elsewhere. Yeah. The way that, yeah, the T's and C's often say the detail of that, but, but yeah, it sounds like a good thing to tell users so they know what's going on. Yeah, and I think the thing about T's and C's is they're not really machine readable. So you wouldn't necessarily on the client be able to say, you know, you can't cancel this. Um, yeah. Things like, things like booking.com do actually, actually do quite a good job of, of saying this is something you can cancel up until this particular point in time or mm. this is something you can't cancel. So, we could, so there's different ways to, to handle this. Um, so we could be... So we could, in the same way that we're advertising kind of service level information around terms and conditions, we could have an indicator to say whether cancellations are supported more broadly. But the fallback would be if there's no cancel action, then obviously you can't, you can't do that. Um, within the, in terms of how, in terms of the window in which you can do a cancellation, that feels like information that should be available on the order that there should be some properties on that to say you can cancel until on maybe a date or date time to indicate that. Um, Might be very available already actually. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 mean, I, haven't, I haven't even looked. I was just kind of started to think about it earlier and realized that, that that's kind of stuff, that these are kind of requirements we've not really dug into. Um, the, the other thing is that um, often because of those limitations, you can cancel, you just can't do it online. So for, for Fusion, you can actually call up the site the site has a manual process, I'm pretty sure it's paper-based, um, and then they will uh, initiate a bank transfer, uh, which will then go back, when you put your bank details in, they'll put the money back in your account. Obviously, that's totally out of band, but it does mean that it's you can cancel a thing, you just can't click the button and do it. You have to go through all of that process. But it, so, but, well, that's an interesting thing, though. If it, so if we're doing like a third-party system and the broker is doing the payments, I would expect the broker to be able to refund um, well this is where it's interesting so the broker could in theory because it's a tokenized card detail the broker could push it back onto the credit card it's come from but of course if the, if the system doesn't handle cancellation internally and through the APIs then um, you, you won't be able to then register that has happened so what does so what does that mean for the user interfa interaction? So saying okay, we'll refund your money, but you now need to ring up this phone number to confirm that you're not attending. Doesn't feel great. No. Um, well, the current way it's working is that the, the cancellation is just not allowed. <laughs> so right. that solves okay. it because a number of a number of brokers actually um, don't allow cancellation anyway. It's just a policy. Um, Okay. But obviously, that's not ideal. We want to move towards a place where this this is a feature that's in there, and we want to encourage people to adopt it. So, um, yeah, I, I think making it a should or a must as an implementation point is is a really good idea because what, why can't you do that over the API? You can do it within the interface. So, but well, if but if there are, if some platforms don't support it technically and they don't support it policy, we can't really put a must in at the moment. So it it be yeah. good, and we need to think about how we advertise that. Yeah, I've looked at schema and neither offer or order has anything about cancellation. Um, so we probably have to extend. And it feels it feels kinder to the user to do it at the point of the offer. Because um, if they if they discover when they've actually placed the order or when they've created the order that they, they can't cancel it, that might feel like a, a bit of a bad feeling. Yeah. I mean they haven't paid at that point, I guess. So I, I guess if they get to the point where they've created an order and they discover then that they can't cancel it, then they might back out the payment and um, I've got to just let the lease expire. I think, it, I think it's also just kind of um, making it available at as many points as possible so that people have as much opportunity to see what the cancellation policy is. Because obviously, if, again, as you say, Chris, like if you only see it once you've put it in your basket, or, yeah, I'm kind of coming from a non-technical point of view, I guess, but like, mm. once you've got it in your basket, it's possible that you miss that bit and then you might feel like you've been missold again. So I think yeah. kind of surfacing it at the point of seeing the opportunity at, and potentially again at the point of when that's kind of in your basket, kind of having it all along the route, if you like, I think whether or not you kind of specify that people have to do it that way. But I think there's certainly a, a should around kind of, surfacing that information in a way that kind of users can
genuinely understand what they're buying essentially i think it's yeah. really important agreed i think it, it's sort of from a user needs perspective it 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 feels like a kindness to the user and i think if we're if we're trying to make this thing as easy to do as booking a hotel it might be worth just looking at what those sort of platforms do and, and what are their best practices i think that's a good idea yeah so um, just a random thought on the way to do all of this, because it sounds like we're adding even more properties to this little offer that's duplicated many times. Um, have you looked at aggregate offer? Because aggregate offer can be used in place of offer and is designed to um, pull together properties from a number of offers uh, into one and also contains offers. So it might be that we can specify offer with an aggregate offer. The aggregate offer has the booking, the cancellation policy, the terms of service, all the things. And then that, it, creates, it creates a bit of an inheritance model like we've got with event. So you can basically bung everything into the aggregate offer and then only, re, only have the things duplicated that need to be duplicated across all the offers that are in there. Mm. Okay, we can have a look at that. I, like personally, I, I'm, I kind of lean towards pushing it out of band completely and just having it, having a, a, a public service, a discoverable public service endpoint that has this configuration in it. And then we can have, we can have in whatever level of detail we need and we doesn't have to go into the feeds. It's only going to be useful for brokers that need that as part of the booking workflow rather than requiring every data consumer to kind of have that information. We, we just bear, bear in mind that there's challenges around the architecture for that. So obviously feeds are public and open. All the API stuff is currently shared, closed and behind uh, authentication. So obviously adding that uh, is all the points you made before. We can definitely do that, but the complication it, there's a lot of complexity to do that and figure out how we do that. And maybe if it's only, and especially with the systems like Bookwen that have a feed with a mix of different uh, events, with a mix of different, different, mix of different providers. Um, so yeah, don't know. But if, if there's a thinking of ways of optimizing the, the event object itself rather than going kind of meta on this, because I guess you could challenge a lot of, well, there might be other, other optimizations you can make in that same way. Yeah. Okay. Well, we could we can um, we can whiteboard it out. I, I'm just, I'm, the reason I'm a little bit hesitant around the kind of inheritance stuff is that it can add a lot of complexity itself in terms of how you know how and where things are being inherited and what that means in terms of how much how much information you need to have harvested or indexed before being able to properly interpret that. Um, Whereas something that is just pointed at from a regular location could be easier on the consumer side, but yeah, there's always a trade-off. Um, okay. I guess also you might have situations where specific offers um, are cheaper because they're not allowed to be cancelled and things like that. So you you know you that's why I'm, I'm leaning towards it being something on the offer rather than on the event. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got we've got a bit more work to do on that. Um, any other thoughts, or can I just briefly move on to the extension point stuff? Okay. I'm going to move on then. Um, so <clears throat> when we had the booking workshop um, a little while ago, um, there was a there was a kind of big discussion in there around. Um, what the what the roadmap might be, what other requirements that platforms have uh, around booking customers, memberships, all this kind of stuff. Um, and what I tried to articulate there is that this is really just the kind of the core building block around which we can start to support other use cases um, as part of the open active standards work or specific uh, um, booking systems might decide to extend the spec themselves to you know, build out their own extra bits of the API or provide other information. So I just one of the things, a, a good kind of test at this point is to just think about what, they, what the points of extension are in the current specification to allow us and others to build on it to support these other requirements. So you know, can, can, we, can we encompass stuff? So I just wanted to kind of list out the ways that the, the API can currently be extended to see whether we're missing anything um, 
uh, or whether we need to kind of document this. I think we may need a look, some more words in spec just to kind of capture some of this nuance because I've been putting a bit more information around how to extend the core data model, for example, and we might need that in the booking spec too. So at the moment, there's three broad ways that you can um, extend the current model. So we can add new endpoints. So you can just build out parallel bits of your API to expose, if you want to expose a payment interface, then somebody could do that. Uh, and a broker could choose to use that or might be required to use that as part of integrating with a booking system. Um, there can be uh, separate endpoints around customers, etc. And what we'd be recommending is that people follow the same design approach as we've been taking with the core API, that they're building on schema.org, using JSON LD, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so that it's consistent with the approach that we've taken. Um, so that means within the, within the spec, you know, we'd expect people to be following the kind of what we've got documented in the common requirements, um, uh, you know, around security, error handling, all that kind of thing, so that those apply. And I think at the moment, within the few, this that need, probably needs to be spelled out a little bit more in the future versions of the API section to include a bit more about um, extensions. Um, so I'm thinking there about some of the the, the stuff we did, at Nick, around the was it 0 0.5, 0.4, which had a much more had many more endpoints that was kind of outside the, the initial set of requirements. Um, the, we can also add new actions. So we're using uh, the approach we're taking is that um, um, URLs are discoverable using potential action. So currently we've got actions for paying, reserving and uh, cancelling. So platforms could add extra features to their API by defining new potential actions that point to new custom endpoints. So if I wanted to implement a wish list, for example, then I could put define a new custom uh, add you know add me to wish list action that is advertised on an event that points to my custom endpoints that would hopefully use the same kind of modeling approach um, and that somebody could start experimenting with that without us having to put it into the spec immediately. Um, and then uh, oops, uh, adding new properties. So actually some of the discussion just being adding like adding more information around offers uh more detail into um some of the order information for example um that is uh you know people can obviously do that in the same way as they are with the current data model and they can define their own custom properties um that's a little uh, that needs a little bit more uh, work from their side because they need to document the semantics so um and we need to think about what it means for a client who might see um, a client application that might get retrieve an offer that's got a whole bunch of custom properties on it, what should its default approach be? Should it just try to obey the ones that um, it can understand, do its best effort, or should it ignore offers if there's properties on it that it doesn't know how to apply? Um, and I can I can see arguments both ways, but my I think what I'm leaning towards is that if you find an offer that's got custom properties on it, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't be offering it as a booking option because those offer details might be, you know, details around a membership offer or some other more complex kind of uh, pricing or uh, purchasing scheme that you can't properly action. So it's a, a, bit, a bit of a kind of runs counter to that kind of, you know, generally we want clients to do their best effort with data, but I think because Anywhere that there's money involved, being a bit more cautious about what we suggest people to do is probably a, a better default starting point. I wonder if there's a way of um, separating additional useful data for an offer that is optional to display, but is, is nice to have. So I'm thinking of things like some of the endpoints have got payment frequency and, or maybe not, that way. yeah, just, or age range, which I know we've added in now, but. Um, stuff that doesn't make any material difference to the um, to the processing versus stuff like um, I don't know something that would have a material difference to the processing. I can't think of an example. But. But, yeah. So, but that means being able to um, like discover or find that information somewhere. You know, it needs to be. Um, you know, thinking in a world where people could be consuming 
offers from multiple different providers, how do you know that this custom property is like, I was going to go convention over configuration. Um, just we define as a, a, you know some kind of prefix that means this is safe to crack on. This is another type of prefix that means halt, go no further. This is going to be bad if you try and process this or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think how that works in a kind of um, schema.org world because I'm a bit wary about just defining like naming conventions because they can be a bit brittle. So whether it, we maybe translate that into a kind of structure that you know maybe there's a you can pack in some name value pairs attached to an offer that for those things, but anything else. Or you do something like I was, I was reading up on Jason LD yesterday just for fun. As you do, and um, the context. Uh, I know you can uh, you can put stuff in context sometimes. It's that, that changes the meaning of a particular uh, object. So I don't know. Maybe there's just we we there's a markup that you can put in that just. That that's what I meant by just making it discoverable. That uh, I didn't get to finish the thought. That that it would be in. We'd require them to publish, but a context that would have some properties in it to say, you know, my extension custom property has got an annotation in it to say it's fine to just display the value of this to a user you don't need to uh, be able to process it in some way in order to complete the offer sorry I see what you mean I thought you were talking about kind of more complex discoverability like we were saying earlier that, that sounds fair that's yeah. just the custom namespace stuff that we've already yeah. got yeah but it, it, it would it would mean that every consumer would have to be ready to pull down the context um, because like, whenever you find a custom property, you'd have to pull down the context to see if you had information ab about it in mm. there. And we'd still have to have a default processing rule of what you do if it's not properly documented or you have an error condition for you know, fetching the context. You know, there's, yeah. It's the usual kind of pulling on a bit of wool. There's, there's, always, there's always something else to think about. Um, Hopefully we can get the most of the core stuff into the spec, so we don't need to worry about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we could. I mean, like for the purposes of getting to 1.0, we could just say, like, um, at the moment we rec you know, here's how you can add new endpoints. Here's how you can add new actions. We don't recommend you and putting extra properties into offers for the moment. And for this version of the spec, we'd suggest not processing them until. You know, we've had further, you know, further experience with what people want to add in. Yeah. On the discussion rather than ended up specifying something that might be suboptimal. Yeah. Agreed. In the light of that, should we also talk about how we'd anticipate extending into things like shopping carts and cancelling individual items within an order? Uh, I think I don't think we have to. I think we can include those as kind of examples of things that people might want to do, but I don't think we need to spell them out. Okay, cool. We can go down the road of actually specifying it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Is there something around how people are sharing this with, you know, say someone who does go away and kind of create one of these extension points? Um, I don't know if. Again, apologies if that's kind of covered in other things or that's just obvious for everyone else on the call. Um, but kind of obviously if, um, if people are kind of creating those things, how much would there would be an expectation to share that learning and those kind of that code or whatever back in back into the community? No, that's that's a great question. And um, you, you're right. We, we should have something to say if you are including custom actions, custom endpoints in your API, you should be documenting them. You know, you should be, uh, we, we don't have to say that there's one way to do it, but you should be publishing some level of API documentation, some level of information to support your users as part of having a good developer experience around your API. So I think we can include something along those lines. It's probably important to say uh, at this point that um, 
based on feedback we've had from a lot of different organizations um, and pulling in a, call, a conversation we had with NetPulse earlier, a large amount of the value from this work is in uniformity of implementation across a number of providers. And extensions, although they're great for a short-term learning, um, they do undermine the overall goal if we end up becoming, if they become the kind of de facto approach. Um, and, and certainly all the providers we've spoken to so far would much rather contribute to an open standards process which can move uh, at a good pace and involve those in the specification and get around that when, with the things they care about um, than, and obviously we need to give them a method to do that and, for, and time scales and all that stuff, but um, they would rather do that than um, have custom stuff because the custom stuff just doesn't, um, yeah, doesn't help. Yeah, 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 I, I, I agree with you. Um, that, uh, I think we've got language around that in the modeling spec um, and that we can just probably carry over here. But I think it's kind of saying, encouraging that this is what we expect you to do, you know, participate, contribute, let's standardize. But if you absolutely must run ahead, then here's how to do it in a way that isn't going to be completely inconsistent with the rest of what people are doing. Yeah, it allows you to go back and update your endpoint afterwards without breaking everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on that? Um, we're nearly out of time. Um, the, the last couple of things I was just going to mention is just kind of uh, reiterate to people that we've got a few proposals out for the, the 2.0 version of the data model that um, could do with some community feedback or, or even more feedback. Yeah, more feedback from the team, but also from the open active team, but also the community. So um, the three I wanted to highlight, um, uh, issue 63, adding more specific types of events um, will be a fairly big change, but hopefully clarify the, the relationship between um, events that are in feeds at the moment. URL templates, I think is quite critical for scheduled events and making sure that they, those can be booked as well. Um, because we need a predictable way to generate the API, and API endpoints for uh, events that run on the schedule. Um, and then 78, which is the kind of uh, validation rules. Um, uh, we've had some, uh, some reasonable discussion around already, and the data model validator is currently implementing, the, um, implementing that. So the best way to actually explore that is probably through the validator. Um, the validator itself, was, we'd still like to get some feedback on the UX and features. Um, you can find it at the, the current working version at uh, validator.openactive.io. That will be the, the production location, although what's there at the moment you should consider to be a development server, so it might get updated or be changing um, as we do work on it. Um, if you've got feedback, then you can follow the bit.ly link in the slide. Uh, file a bug report or just drop me an email. Um, the, the main thing to highlight it is tracking the 2.0 specification. So some feeds which are currently valid will be reported as invalid um, just because we've got some stricter rules um, in the spec. Um, so it's a good way to kind of get uh, actually play around with um, current data and see how it's going to evolve. Um, so if you are currently publishing data, then uh, playing around the validator is a good way to get ahead of what changes might need to be coming down the line. Um, as I said early on in uh, the planning for 2.0, we will do some work to uh, provide individual publishers with some guidance on what they need to do in order to migrate so that we can try and get everybody move towards the 2.0 spec as quickly as possible after, um, after it's released. Um, in terms of timescales, we're still planning to um, release 1.0 booking spec, 2.0 the model to the end of the month. So that's obviously going to be pending any major issues come up. We've obviously got some stuff to work through on booking. Um, the, um, the data model uh, changes, I think, are um, you know, we need to get some more feedback on those proposals. But I'm, again, I'm reasonably I think those are reasonably robust, but I'd just like to get some more eyes on it. So I think hitting the end of the month is, um, is achievable. Um, if we have to uh, de-scope anything, then I think the thing that may drop from 2.0 is the roots work. Um, we had the call we had a fortnight ago, 
there was quite a lot of discussion around how that should look, um, which might need a bit of thinking. So rather than rush that out, we can wait for 2.1 to put that in place. So because I want to focus on, you know, the main thing we want to achieve with 2.0 was tidying up some of the, um, the, the data quality related issues. Um, so that's one thing that might give. Um, and the validator is on track for being um, pretty much complete uh, as well. Uh, so that, that's where we are today. In terms of schedule for next call, the one on the 29th will be um, just looking at whatever major issue, if there are any major issues or blockers that we need that are going to stop us from releasing those uh, specs. Um, I will be putting out a kind of an official, as far as we do it, a kind of call to the list for people to raise objections with the current uh, drafts. Um, you know, that, that would mean that we need to delay, you know, into September for final, you know, addressing any outstanding comments or whether people are happy for us to move forward with those major version changes. Um, so I'm going to keep the call in, the first call in September open um, just because we may need to discuss any kind of um, remaining issues from those point releases. Um, but having done that, then we can start to focus on some other things. So I'm proposing that uh, we uh, rejoin some of the discussion around activity lists in September, end of September. Um, we'll do some uh, additional, additional work around that in the short term, but we'll focus the call on it uh, on the 26th. Um, so that, that's where we are so far. Um, uh, anything else that anyone wants to raise on the call? Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll wrap us up for today. Just a quick one, Lee. Uh, all this stuff is really relevant to what we're looking at at the moment, so no, it's good timing and, and seems like a lot of progress is being made, so good stuff on that, guys. Um, how, just for, how do I get this um, presentation? For some reason, the mailing list is like, sometimes it sends it to me, sometimes it doesn't, um, so I'm not sure what the easiest way to find this, so I can share it with um, James. Okay, um, so I, I am trying to... Uh, send a summary round to the list. Um, the list also has a, a public uh, public archive of all of the emails that I send okay. out. So if you've missed one, you can you can go back to it. I can I can circulate, I can email that directly so you don't miss it. Um, yeah, if you could just send me a link to this because it will just um, help, help to inform us quite a lot. Yeah, for sure. Perfect. Yeah, and we can also, I can also put stuff out on, um, on Slack as well. Just yeah, I think it's some of my emails being weird. Sometimes I get your emails, sometimes I'll find out about them through other ways and I just don't know what's going on with it. Okay, cool. All right, um, anything else from anyone? No? Okay, well, um, thanks again for participating. Um, another useful discussion. Um, and I will uh, speak to you all in a couple of weeks. Not before. <laughs> Thanks all. Yeah,